Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Jacob Radel. I am an attending here in endocrinology at Cincinnati Children's, and um, I'm going to be covering type 2 diabetes. Um, of note, uh, type 1 diabetes, um, the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus in general, and DKA, which can also occur in type 2 diabetes, was covered in the type 1 presentation. Um, so this will just cover type 2, and it will be short and sweet, and that pun was intended. Um, so going into the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, it's very important that you understand um, from a basic level that type 2 diabetes is a condition of insulin resistance as opposed to type 1, which is a condition of immune-mediated islet cell destruction. And so type 2 diabetes, um, at diagnosis, the islet cell antibody screen should always be negative. And in general, when diagnosing type 2 diabetes on the boards, um, if you're looking at labs, type 2 diabetes will be a child or teenager um, with high levels of insulin, which would indicate insulin resistance, as opposed to a child with low levels of insulin, which would indicate deficiency, as would be seen in type 1 diabetes. Now, in practical terms, um, there can be some overlap there, um, you know, with beta cell exhaustion or things like that in type 2 diabetes, but for the most part, um, for testing, high insulin would indicate resistance in type 2 diabetes. Um, and also, uh, you know, a term that sometimes gets used uh, that isn't necessarily wrong, but it does not clarify the type of diabetes is IDDM, or insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, and non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Um, these are not synonymous with type 1 and type 2. Um, patients with type 2 diabetes might be treated with insulin, so you might say it's a type 2 diabetes patient with insulin dependence or who is on insulin. Um, and so we generally don't use those terms very often, and we try to stick to um, classifying based upon the underlying pathophysiology, which would be type 1 or type 2, or there are other um, subtypes as well. So in diagnosing type 1 versus type 2, or some of the rarer types of diabetes, um, an islet cell antibody screen um, is very helpful. Uh, so if the antibodies are present, uh, the patient has type 1 diabetes. If there are no antibodies present, and there is a picture of insulin resistance, meaning a large waist circumference, um, or signs such as acanthosis, um, that is pretty clearly type 2 diabetes. There are some cases um, where it may be difficult to um, know whether the patient looks to be insulin resistant or insulin sensitive, um, so additional testing may be warranted, and even patients with negative antibodies may have type 1 diabetes, which we classify as type 1B diabetes, um, but they also may have type 2 diabetes, um, and so there are some nuances there with the diagnosis. From a board's perspective, just know that antibodies present indicates type 1, whereas negative antibodies and a picture of insulin resistance generally would indicate type 2 diabetes. It's important to understand the epidemiology of type 2 diabetes. Um, so in adolescents and young adults, type 2 diabetes is increasing. Uh, the mean age of diagnosis is nearly 14 years of age in youth onset type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> um, the overall incidence is increasing. The incidence in females and in males are increasing. The incidence at, as young teenagers or pre-teenagers is increasing, as well as in late, later adolescents. Um, and then as far as race, ethnicity, um, there is an increasing prevalence in non-Hispanic whites and African Americans, Hispanic population, um, and there are, although a higher, higher percentage in the um, American Pacific Islanders and the American Indian populations than the non-Hispanic white population, the trend did not increase as of um, the most recent publication from the Search for Diabetes Youth Study. Um, so big picture is that overall diabetes is increasing and specifically in the non-Hispanic white, African American, and Hispanic population. Risk factors for type 2 diabetes, um, we're fairly familiar with these, but of course an overweight BMI, um, an increase in weight for height, or a weight above um, ideal uh, body mass, um, and then also other risk factors include family history of type 2 diabetes in a first or second degree relative, uh, certain races or ethnicities have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, evidence of insulin resistance on exam, which would include acanthosis or conditions associated with insulin resistance, um, such as 
uh, conditions associated with metabolic syndrome, PCOS, um, or children who are born SGA, um, they also have an increased risk of insulin resistance later in life. Um, and then a maternal history of diabetes or gestational diabetes during the pregnancy. Screening for, um, for diabetes specifically is indicated in overweight or obese youth. We screen uh, with a fasting glucose um, and or a hemoglobin A1C. Uh, in general, a fasting insulin is no longer used as a part of our first line screening for uh, overweight and obese youth looking for type 2 diabetes. Usually we want to see evidence of dysglycemia, so we specifically look at the glucose or A1C. Um, if fasting glucose or A1C are normal, but you still have a very high suspicion, um, then an oral glucose tolerance test um, is also a reasonable way to screen for type 2 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, um, we do a number of uh, screening uh, tests to look for comorbidities. So we do a number of labs and evaluations at the time of diagnosis. Now this is in contrast to type 1 diabetes in which some of these can wait three to five years after diagnosis. Um, we screen for nephropathy at the time of diagnosis um, and then we look annually and we do that by getting a urine microalbumin or an albumin to creatinine ratio. We screen for retinopathy. We ask the ophthalmologist to do a retinal exam to look for retinopathy annually. We screen for NAFLD and NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, at diagnosis and yearly. And then we also check lipids for dyslipidemia um, at diagnosis and yearly. Um, all of these um, are, are very important screening programs, um, especially with um, diabetes being associated with microvascular complications and being a cardiovascular risk factor. So treatment for type 2 diabetes in youth is fairly straightforward now. Uh, probably won't be quite so straightforward in the future. There are a lot of clinical trials underway looking at other um, types of treatments that are used very widely in adults. But right now, the main ways that we treat type 2 diabetes are with metformin, and if needed, we add on basal insulin. Um, again, I don't think you'll need to know the specifics about some of the other types of therapies, um, but maybe the next uh, few years, uh, some of those will be used in type 2 diabetes as well. And we actually have some trials ongoing at Cincinnati Children's. Um, after 18 years of age, if you're encountering patients um, at that age, you may see some of them on some of these alternative therapies, um, including GLP-1 agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGL-2 inhibitors, um, and others. The American Diabetes Association uh, recently released an algorithm for initial treatment for patients with new onset um, diabetes uh, and suspected patients with type 2 diabetes, so in overweight youth. Uh, who likely have type 2 diabetes. So if the A1C is under 8.5% and they do not have ketones or acidosis, then you can start uh, only with metformin and you titrate that up to a dose of 2,000 milligrams per day. If the A1C is above 8.5% and there is no ketosis or acidosis, they do recommend starting basal insulin uh, in addition to metformin. And then if uh, there is acidosis or DKA, or a hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, uh, then they recommending, recommend um, managing with um, you know, IV insulin, as you typically would, and uh, then starting basal bolus until you have a better idea of what the, the condition you're treating is. Of note, DKA can happen in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, so just because you have DKA does not necessarily mean that it has to be type 1. So then after you start treatment, or at the time you start treatment, you should be checking uh, islet cell autoantibodies. If those are negative, then you continue to treat as if it's type 2 diabetes with metformin plus or minus basal insulin. And if the antibodies are positive, then you have type 1 diabetes and uh, you should plan on treating that patient with basal insulin um, along with bolus insulin. And then depending on the state of insulin resistance, you may or may not continue metformin. So that's the end of this presentation.